Welcome to my next playthrough series. Another Pokemon Emerald Hardcore Nuzlocke, but with a special twist. You see, evolution has always been a major mechanic in these games, dating all the way back to Pokemon's earliest titles, and it has definitely contributed to the overall popularity of these games. Sure, when your Pokemon level up, they may improve their stats and pick up some new moves, but nothing beats the feeling of true progression than when your companions evolve. I mean, come on, there's even a cutscene each time it happens, for Christ's sake. But what would Pokemon be like if evolution was removed? Well, that's what I'm gonna find out. Join me on my new journey to conquer Pokemon Emerald with only single stage Pokemon. Rule set is in the description and other than that I hope you guys enjoy the series. Let's do this. Oh man, it feels good to be back in another playthrough. Let's hope we have just as much success with this challenge as we did with the walkthrough. Single stage Pokemon are going to be very interesting to use because I feel like most players would consider them to be underperformers overall, and I can see why I guess. Because their stats are generally lower compared to fully evolved Pokemon, they may not hold up as well in the later stages of the game. However, their stats are also significantly higher than the base forms of those evolved Pokemon, potentially making the early game much much easier to navigate through. In any case, I'm really excited to see what these guys can do together, especially the ones I haven't played a whole lot with. Let's jump right into starter selection, because I bet that's what you guys are most interested to see, and I am very excited about it. For my starter, I have replaced Torchic with Cast Form. Yes, after thinking about it for a while, I decided to go with Cast Form as my starter for this playthrough. Why, you may ask? Well, mostly for the memes, but there are some other reasons as well that I think make a lot of sense for this kind of run. As I mentioned just a second ago, while single stage Pokemon do tend to have less stats overall compared to fully evolved Pokemon, they also tend to have huge stat totals when you compare them to most early game Pokemon. The early game would become completely trivial if I decided to use something like Heracross, Girafferig, or even Relicanth all of which have stats that are much higher and very well distributed, as well as getting some powerful early moves such as Horn Attack and Stab Confusion for Giraffe Rig. Cast Form's base stat total isn't the worst by any means, but since they are all distributed evenly, a lot of those stats end up going to waste. The attack stat in particular is just not going to be useful in this run. I also like that he's of the normal type, and won't have any stab other than tackle until I unlock the weather moves later on in the game. Overall, he's just very balanced and while I think he'll do a good job early, I'll have to get more creative with him as the run progresses. And I'm just excited to use Cast Form, which I have never done for more than a few minutes at a time. As usual, it's time to blow through the early game slog by defeating our rival, helping Wally catch a Pokemon that evolves twice, which is just, just, I mean, it's just silly. I mean, evolving Pokemon is dumb. I mean, who, who'd want to do that? And grinding through Route 104 and Petalburg Woods. It's really just going to be a straight shot to Roxanne and then Doofer Town. Our first encounter after our starter won't actually come until after the first badge, and there aren't a whole lot of notable item pickups along the way. Plus, Cast Form shouldn't have too much of an issue against anything at this point in the game, especially once I hit level 10 and pick up Ember, Water Gun, and Powder Snow at the same time. Lots of great coverage right off the bat. And I am also glad that I don't have to go through some sort of crazy early game grind. If I don't get through this run on the first try, this section of the game should always go by pretty quickly. I enter Rustboro, pick up the usual HM for Cut, Quick Claw, train a bit on Route 116, hitting level 10 mid-fight, learning three moves immediately, and all of a sudden having fantastic coverage was an experience I don't think I've ever had before. That was really cool, and I really like the moveset. Also just makes grinding a lot less of a slog. It's nice that tackle is stab, but having all of these options is just great. It doesn't take long for Cast Form to level up to the cap, and we're all ready for Roxanne and the first gym. Without running any damage calculations or anything, I have a feeling this will be over pretty quickly. The fight starts out as expected, Castform has no issues at all bringing down the first two Geodudes with Water Gun. I had lost a little bit of HP from one of the gym trainers because I accidentally used Tackle on the Geodude, but I felt like it didn't matter much anyway.
Nose Pass comes out, and I was dealing a bit less damage than I thought I would. Cast Form's water guns seemed pretty comparable to Mudkips at this level, but I do suppose that Water Gun is also stabbed for Mudkips, so I guess that's where all the extra damage comes from. In any case, this fight still went over fairly smoothly. Roxanne did end up using all of her potions, which elongated the battle for quite a while, but her terrible AI would eventually start using Tackle instead of Rock Tomb as soon as we become slower than Nose Pass, so there's always that we can count on. Eventually, Nose Pass falls, giving us an easy first gym patch. The early game in this run definitely seems a bit boring, especially when you guys see what our next encounter is, but I have a feeling once we get to Watson and beyond, the difficulty will ramp up quite a lot. Looking forward to all of that, and my future encounters. Now it's time to pretend like we care about helping the Devon Corporation when all we really care about is saving Pico. Mr. Briney's a pretty nice guy. I always enjoy getting his little buddy back for him. <sighs> and then there's this stupid request. I've already ranted about this enough, although I have thought about making a video about Mr. Stone's letter someday. Like, what's in that letter? I need to know. <laughs> has anyone done a real speculation video on this before? As much as I rag on Mr. Stone for not just picking up the phone within the device that his company invented, I am still curious about the content of this letter. After rejecting Rival 2, which they get very pissy about by the way, I mean, come on, you forced us to give you our phone number, I'm sure forcing us to battle wouldn't be out of character for you either. We we now head to Dooford Town where our second badge awaits, as well as our first encounter of the run. On the way down, our dad calls and Mr. Briney feels the need to just stop the boat because I'm on the phone. Like, dude, I appreciate your courtesy, but you can just keep going if you want. I suppose having the text box continue to function while other things are happening on the screen was just too much for Game Freak to handle back then. <laughs> or even now for that matter. I love Dooford. Always reminded me of Cyanwood and Gold and Silver. After picking up the silk scarf and the old rod, I head north to Granite Cave to pick up our next encounter. Facing Brawly with only cast form I think would just be impossible, unless Brawly's AI really messes up, but I doubt it. So I'm gonna need some more help. That help comes in the form of an old friend of mine, Sableye. Sableye is actually fantastic, and I'm serious about that. It's ironic because when I first created my tier list for Emerald, I rated him as one of the worst in the game, and it's just not true. You know, I really should go back to that list someday and redo it because I got a lot of stuff wrong. Sableye's stats aren't great, which is really what gives people pause when they think about using him, but his typing, moveset, and especially matchups more than make up for his poor stats. Zero weaknesses and three fantastic immunities. As you'll see in just a minute, it, Brawly will beg for his life when I send this thing out to wreak havoc on his team. But Sableye is also fantastic in fights such as Norman and Tate and Liza as well. Also just a great pivot Pokemon, he's just great. I've grown to love him a lot. After about a dozen Pokeballs or so, I did eventually catch him. Catch rate must be really low I guess, but at least we got him. I navigate through the rest of the cave to give Steven his letter, trek back to Rustboro to grab the real reward in the experience share, and while I'm in the area I train up Sableye and Wismer Cave just to get some extra HP EVs in while I can. Early HP EVs are very helpful in my experience, and Sableye is a decent target for them since he's not primarily an attacker. It's really nice having Wismer Cave accessible so early as well, making the EV training process just a lot easier. I guess Wismer can be pretty useful after all. Just, uh, just not as a member of my team. One of these days I'll do a playthrough of some kind where I'll be forced to use it. After training up Sableye to be close enough to Brawly's level cap, I head back over to Dooford Town to challenge the second gym. Although, ironically, it'll be a little less of a, uh, challenge than Roxanne was. Sableye will not have any issues here. Time for Brawly, let's get that second badge. There is of course not a whole lot to see here as not a single attacking move that Brawly's Pokemon possess can actually hit Sableye. At least in Ruby and Sapphire his Makuhita has knockoff, but it's not like that's very helpful either. Watching Brawly's Pokemon struggle is honestly pretty hard to watch. All he can do is bulk up and make his Pokemon look super scary without them actually being any sort of threat at all. It's like watching a boxing match where one of the guys is doing dumbbell curls, squats, and push-ups in the middle of the fight while the other guy is just wailing on him. Sorry Brawly, all of the potions and citrus berries in the world won't save you here buddy.
While it took quite a lot of power points to get through this, Machop, Metatite, and Makuhita eventually go down, and Brawly awards us with our second gym badge. Two down, six to go. Now that Brawly has fallen, it's time to move on to Slayport to continue our quest. The level of challenge should certainly start to increase with Rival 3 and Watson on the horizon, but at least we'll be picking up some well-needed encounters along the way. You know, I realize that Slayport does have the Battle Tent slash Contest Hall, but I really kind of wish it had a gem of its own. I know it's pretty close to Duford, and there wouldn't exactly be a whole lot of progression or content in between, but this place is just so big and busy and alive. Captain Stern could be the gem leader. Yeah, I think it would've been cool. I collect all of the various items in town, and on the beach, battle some trainers, beat up some punks, and finally deliver the Devon goods to Captain Stern. Hey, Mr. Stone, I, uh, I delivered those goods for you. So you, uh, you got any more rewards for me, maybe? Well, I guess that's a no. <laughs> Route 110 will allow us to add either Plusel or Minin to the team, although very likely Minin because Plusel only has a 1% chance to appear. And as expected, we do get the Minin. The differences between these two are pretty small, with their stats being distributed slightly differently and with one of their supporting move slots being different as well. Minin gets Charm, while Plusel gets Fake Tears. Between those two options, I think I prefer Fake Tears overall just a little bit more, especially in Emerald. Most of the scarier fights in the game utilize specially bulky Pokemon more often, other than maybe Norman and Winona. But like I said, the differences aren't all that crazy, and both are great pickups. In addition to Charm, Minin has access to other great support options like Thunder Wave and Encore. He's got great speed, some surprisingly decent special bulk, and passable offenses as well. Thunderbolt will still hit things pretty damn hard regardless of who uses it. I take care of some more training on Route 110 now that we have our new team member, and then Professor Birch swoops in to impede our progress and forcefully extract our phone number from us. Like father, like daughter, I guess. With everyone on the team trained up, it's time for Rival 3 and the first team review of the series. Manning the front lines on this one is our newest team member, Minin. I had to level Minin all the way up to the level cap in order to ensure that Spark would kill Lombre in two hits. I'm trying to keep him as healthy as possible just in case I need to use him for Slugma later on in the fight, because it very well might come down to Castworm and Sableye together bringing that Marshtomp down. Castworm is up next, and I'll be switching him into Marshtomp after Lombre goes down. I'll set up Rain Dance and then use Water Gun until I can no longer take any more damage. I'll most likely have to risk a crit there, there's just no way around it unfortunately. If Marshtomp decides to go for Bide instead, I can get some free damage in and then switch into Sableye who will be immune to the attack. Attack. That would be the best case scenario. In either case, Sableye will hopefully be able to finish off the job. Slugma will be handled by whoever is the healthiest. Cast Form would be the best because a Rain Dance boosted Water Gun should one shot it, but I could very well have to use Minin instead if Cast Form is too low. I feel like I always have to take bigger risks in this fight, it's always so close, but I guess that's Rival 3 for you. Let's get into it. I lead with Minin and I get a crit with Spark right off the bat, bringing down Lombre. Huge start to this fight and a very big confidence booster for me. Marsh Tom comes in and I switch into cast form. I take a mud shot on the switch as expected and my speed drops. I then set up Rain Dance as Marsh Tom goes for another mud shot. This time though, my speed is brought low enough to where I'm now slower. Normally, this isn't usually a good thing, but it would appear that Marsh Tom's AI is actually very similar to Roxanne's Nose Pass, in that it won't use mud shot after it has surpassed your Pokemon in speed. Can anyone confirm if this happens all of the time, or if this is just a coincidence. I mean, even though it's raining, Mudshot is definitely still a superior option here, right? I guess Bide's damage may be theoretically more if it were to go off if I landed two more water guns, but man, that puts me in a phenomenal position. All I have to do is switch into Sableye on the turn in which Marshtop releases his built up energy, and boom, nothing happens. So much extra free damage from Cast Form without taking any more damage myself. And now that Sableye is out, I can finish this Marsh Tomp off with a single Nightshade.
Barring any sort of crazy crit streak, this one should be in the bag. Slugma comes out and I keep Sableye in to take him down. It only takes two Nightshades to do so, and Rival 3 is done. Definitely the most difficult challenge so far, but we'll have to see what Watson has for us. I just had a quick realization about Rival 3 that I hadn't thought of before. For how difficult and notorious this fight is, the reward you get for it is pretty lackluster. I mean, I guess I shouldn't ex just expect to get a reward from our rival every single time that we face them, even though that is kind of what happens most of the time. Anyone else use the item finder? If you didn't use a guide at all back then, I suppose it could be worth something, but even before the internet, I feel like it wasn't that difficult to find most of the hidden items in this game. Even if you skip over some of the items, it's not like you're missing much anyway. Just a random thought I had. I finally made it to Mauville City, which always just feels nice. My Pokemon are pretty close to the level cap, so I can't fight too many trainers just yet, but I can pick up all the usual items around town and pick up our next encounter on Route 117, Illumise. Well, at least most likely Illumise. There is a 1% chance to get Volbeat as well, but that likely won't happen. And it doesn't. Illumise is another Pokemon that gets a really bad rap, and honestly, after getting to play with one in my purple Pokemon only run, it's not that bad. It will definitely fall off as the game progresses, but for something that you could use right now, especially in some of the scarier random trainers up north, it works just fine. Mostly used as a charm slash encore user, but it can get some coverage like Thunderbolt for example. Now again, since I'm close to the level cap with most of my Pokemon, all I can do right now is level up my Illumise and begin preparations for Watson. I'll be doing this primarily in Wismer Cave just to give him some extra HP EVs while I train. It's not like Illumise can really deal a whole lot of damage to anything else anyway, so... Alright, let me handle this real quick and then we can hop straight into the team review for Watson. I'm leading the charge with Sableye. I'll use him to take out Voltorb and then deal as much damage as I possibly can after that to Electrike when he comes out. Although I'm not very confident that he can take Electrike down as well unless Watson decides to use Hal for some reason. Minin is going to finish off Electrike if needed and then he'll be responsible for Thunder Waving both Magneton and Manectric. That is definitely his primary job for this fight. Any advantage I can get on those two will be important. Castform is up next and he'll be bringing down Magneton with a couple of Sun Boosted Embers. I'm really hoping hoping that Magneton will go for a Thunder Wave or Sonic Boom during this fight so I can maybe stay healthy enough to get an attack off on Manectric as well. Manectric is going to be the biggest problem for this run for sure, and I'm going to attempt to paralyze him with Minin and then switch into Illumise to attempt to take away the Citrus Berry. From there, it's just a combination of whatever Pokemon I have left that are healthy enough to bring Watson down. This is definitely going to be the most uncertain part of the fight, and I'm really hoping I can get some Paralysis procs to work in our favor here. Another series, another Watson fight. Fight. Let's do this. I open up with Sableye, get a free hit in with Fake Out, and then start going for the Nightshades. Shockwave does a little bit less damage than I was expecting, which is great. And a second Nightshade from Sableye brings the Pokeball down. Watson then sends in his Electrike as usual, and I have Sableye throw out some more Nightshades. Electrike goes for Howl right off the bat, which is so strange to me, but you're not going to catch me complaining about it. Nightshade appears to have dealt exactly 50% of Electrike's HP, but after another Nightshade, it looks like we were just off the mark there. If I had trained Sableye up to the very tippy top of level 24, I could have gained another level off of Voltorb, and that would have been enough to two-shot this Electrike. But honestly, this forces Watson to blow a potion on what is absolutely his worst Pokemon. That might actually make the difference in this fight. After a couple more Nightshades, Electrike is back down to 1 HP, and I decide to keep Sableye in and finish the job. I'm not going to be able to use him again with how low his HP is anyway, and I also didn't want to risk Watson using another Super Potion after I switch into Minin, because taking down Electrike with Minin is obviously much more difficult and wasteful. I don't get crit, and Electrike goes down. Magneton now comes out, and I know this is going to be a Shockwave, so I switch into Minin. Minin. 
Minin takes the hit like a champ and then goes for a Thunder Wave to hopefully make things a lot more difficult for this Magneton. It also just guarantees that we are faster moving forward as long as we aren't paralyzed ourselves. Magneton comes back with a Thunder Wave of his own, but we remove the paralysis with a Cherry Berry. Now that we're all set up here, it's time to switch into cast form to bring this thing down. Getting any sort of paralysis proc here would be super huge for us. Magneton goes for Thunder Wave again, and cast form shakes it off with a Cherry Berry of his own. The Sunny Day comes out, and now our Embers should easily KO Magneton with two hits. We get a paralysis proc on Magneton, which is amazing considering we are still at full health, but on the next turn, we do finally get paralyzed. As it turns out though, cast form is still faster than Magneton even with paralysis and a final Ember brings Magneton down. We are in very good shape right now overall, but I have a feeling I'll just, I'll need one more little thing, just one more thing to go our way for this metric. I need another Paralysis proc, or for him to use Howl or something like that. I'm pretty sure Watson can only use one more potion at this point, so that's something I'll have to consider as well. After Cast Form and Sableye level up, the metric hits us with a pretty meaty Shockwave and we go for Ember. The ember lands and we get the burn. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. That is the one thing we needed to go our way. At this point, I thought about staying in just to get as much damage off as possible, but then I thought about that citrus berry. I know Manectric will get hit with burn damage after this turn, but is that enough to drop him into berry range? I don't know, but I decided to take a chance with Illumise right now instead and hope that the door hasn't closed on us yet stealing that citrus berry. The tick of burn damage goes off and no Citrus Berry. Illumise uses Thief next turn and nabs it. We get paralyzed in the process, but it was totally worth it. At this point, knowing that Watson is going to use a Super Potion on the next turn, I switch into Cast Form to see if I can just get one more attack out of him. This is really the only way that I can potentially preserve my entire team, but if I absolutely have to, I will sacrifice Illumise. The potion comes out and then I go for one more Ember. But unfortunately, we're the ones paralyzed now. Still, at least it's another tick of burn damage, and we didn't get crit. I switch into mine in now to bring this one home. Not only does Shockwave not deal a whole lot of damage, but the burn also reduces the damage of Manectric's quick attack by 50% as well. Now it's just a race. Shockwave versus Spark. After a few more, Manectric goes down with one final tick of burn, and Watson is finished. We are awarded with the third gym badge of the run, and as always, defeating Watson really opens up the Hoenn region, and we have a lot of great stuff coming up now. I quickly grab all the usual items lying around the surrounding routes and immediately head north where a bunch of new encounters open up. And would you look at that, leading off another episode with another encounter. The Fiery Path gives us Torkoal, which I am very excited about. I don't know why I like Torkoal so much, considering that on paper he doesn't perform super well in these games, but he's super bulky and has a fantastic ability. And while he may not be as good in the late game, he'll be very nice to have for the next few gyms. After picking up our new team member, I trek all the way back to Wismer Cave to get him some HP EVs while I level him up. I feel like this will be important for his success. Afterwards, I head back north to routes 112 and 113, making my way towards Falibur Town. And along the way, we run into our next encounter, Spinda. This may actually end up being the run where I actually have to use him. I did have a small chance of getting Skarmory instead, which would have been huge. I went back and forth before I started this run on whether or not I should ban him altogether, but I don't think he's good enough in these games to warrant it, and the chance to encounter it is so low that I just didn't bother. We didn't get lucky anyway, so we're still 
stuck with our token Spinda. Spinda is just not that great on paper, and I can't imagine it's any different in practice, but we'll find out. Our next encounter may be obtained, but there's actually some more stuff I'd like to go over here before we reach Falibur Town. It's time for a little Route Spotlight, featuring Route 113. Routes in Pokemon games can be similar to towns and cities in that some are very memorable for one reason or another, and some are not. Route 113 is definitely one of the memorable ones from the Hoenn region, and for more reasons than one. I'm sure everyone remembers it for the aesthetic and the overall atmosphere, and I really like that about it as well. A path of ash that constantly rains down from the mountain above. The little glass workshop halfway through the route is such a cool idea, allowing you to gather that ash as a resource for obtaining some of the coolest items in the whole game. And there's just something oddly satisfying about leaving a clean trail of grass behind you as you run through the route. But before you go about exploring the route in more detail and experience everything that it has to offer, a word of caution. I didn't just happen to randomly pick Route 113 to do a quick analysis on, just because it looks cool. In my opinion, this is one of the most dangerous routes in the whole game, and you should not take the trainer battles here lightly. The ones you'll want to watch out for in particular include the Bird Keeper at the end of the route, as well as all Ninja Boys. This Bird Keeper has a Swellow and a Skarmory, both of which are terrifying at this stage of the game. Steel types can always be annoying to deal with, and I'm pretty sure that Swellow's got double team. In Emerald, you also run the risk of a double battle here as well, which could potentially complicate things depending on how your team is currently constructed. Then there is of course the ninja boys on this route, both of which hide in those little soot piles and jump out at you if you get too close. The one next to the glass shop is really the one that I would completely avoid at all costs if you can. Three coughings with self-destruct. Not very cool. And the other one appears in a mandatory double battle off of one of the ledges, if you choose to go in that direction. He's got his own exploding bag of gas and a ninjask as well to deal with. And that wraps up the Route 113 spotlight. Just something I wanted to bring up while I was here because knowing which random trainers could potentially end your run, or at least make it a lot more difficult, is very valuable information to have. And we finally reach Falibur Town. Cool, someone just left $5,000 on the ground. After talking to Lynette and picking up the TM for Dig on Route 114, we head a little further south to run into our next encounter, Seviper. This is another weird one because I haven't had enough experience with it to get a good feeling of its capabilities. Judging what it can do on paper is even tough to say. It's a mixed attacker with a decent enough ability. It gets crunch along with a pretty wide array of coverage options as well, like Giga Drain, Flamethrower, and Dig slash Earthquake. I can see him being useful for Flannery and possibly elsewhere. Might be good against the evil team admins and leaders too. So Viper's stats are high enough that he'll definitely see some play for sure. I'm just not sure what to expect from him yet. With yet another new member added to the team, I make my way through the rest of Route 114 and reach Meteor Falls where we can get some more story in. I really like this route overall too. The trainers aren't much, but I just like the transitions between the lake, grassy area, and then back into the mountains again. It just sounds like the kind of place I would like to spend my time in. Finally, inside Meteor Falls so we can listen to these goons talk about a rock they stole from a guy named Cosmo? Seriously, is that just a nickname or do your parents hate you? It is somewhat amusing to me that we are required to travel halfway across the Hoenn region just to see that little bit of dialogue, only to have to trek all the way back to where we started, on the other side of Mount Jimny. At least Meteor Falls itself is a really cool place with a really cool theme too. Fortunately for us though, we didn't just come all the way out here to mash through a few text boxes, because here at Meteor Falls we can grab our fourth encounter of the episode in Soul Rock. And this is arguably the best encounter of the episode as well, although it's pretty close alongside Torkoal. For anyone that has been watching my videos since the beginning, you already know the crazy roller coaster relationship I've had with this thing. Started the channel off with a Pokemon tier list for Emerald, and Soul Rock was marked as one of the worst in the game. However, my opinion has drastically changed since then, especially after my worst encounters run I did not too long ago. Soul Rock has a super weak typing in the later stages of the game. But in the mid-game, he's fantastic. Stab, Rock Throw, and Confusion are very helpful for Flannery and Winona, while his typing is great against Norman and Maxi's ace Camerupt as well. Soul Rock will fall off sometime after Winona, but the impact he brings to the table right now cannot be ignored. After training up my new teammates and making that trek back to where I came from that I mentioned earlier, it's time to hop on a cable car and head up to the top of Mount Chimney. I swear, 
there was a time where I would see one every other time I went up here, which is apparently crazy because it's a fairly rare event to occur. Jesus, Archie's Poochiana is moving so fast it looks like it's about to take off into space. I honestly wasn't sure if there would be a boss fight in this episode with how long it normally takes to get from Mauville to Lava Ridge, but hey, here we are. I don't normally do team reviews for Maxie and Archie because they aren't usually a big deal most of the time, but I will say this is one of the more challenging team leader fights, so let's do a quick one. You can see I pretty much have a full team of six, so I'm definitely over prepared for this one. Better safe than sorry in a hardcore Nuzlocke. I'm leading with Torkoal to take out Mighty Anna. Bite is special, which goes against Torkoal's lackluster special defense in this gen, but I'm not too worried about it. Torkoal shouldn't have any issues, but if he does, I can switch into Seviper or Sableye or anyone else for that matter. I'm sending in Torkoal first, so that camera will come out next and hopefully go for a magnitude. From there, I'll switch into Solrock. Even if Camerupt doesn't use magnitude, it's basically a clean switch anyway, with Tackle and Ember both not being very effective against Solrock. Focus energy is the scariest thing for sure, but I don't see Solrock having much of an issue. Cast form will be the backup here with Water Gun. And finally, I'll send in Minin to take out Zubat. Zubat does have Bite, so it's not worth keeping Solrock in and risking a crit or something, even if he's at full HP. So Viper, Sableye, and Cast Form are all backups for this fight. There's a good chance I won't really need them, but you never know. Maxi is up next. Let's do this. The fight starts, and I also just realized that Torkoal's White Smoke ability is also very nice to have against this Mighty Anna's Intimidate and Sand Attack as well. I start going for Body Slams while Mighty Anna uses the expected Bite. The incoming damage is right around where I expected, but I was anticipating Body Slam to hit a bit harder than it was. I knock Mighty Anna down to the red, but then Max uses a potion to bring him back up again. It feels like I'm getting a bit too low, but we do eventually get the Paralyze from Body Slam. I switch over to using Ember to see if that hits a little bit harder maybe? I think my Torkoal's nature reduces his physical attack stat, so Body Slam might not actually be the best here. After a second Ember, Mighty Anna finally goes down, and I didn't need a backup. Camerupt comes out, and so I switch into Soul Rock, anticipating that magnitude. However, Camerupt goes for the best possible move it could make against my team in Focus Energy. I really don't understand the AI in this game sometimes. I mean, unless this camera up is just programmed to use focus energy first no matter what, how in the hell does it not see a kill with magnitude, or even tackle for that matter? I guess my defense stat is pretty high, but still. Luckily, we don't get crit a single time, and Solrock has a fairly easy time taking camera up to down with rock throws. I do miss one after the potion comes out, but with the extra HP I got from the Orenberry, I was in pretty good shape. Maxi sends out his final Pokemon in Zubat, and so I switch into Minin just to be safe. A quick spark takes it out with ease, and our first encounter with Maxi goes swimmingly. Maxi is one of those boss fights that, over time, you kind of take for granted a little bit just because of his level of difficulty. But especially with some of the later fights, his Pokemon can step up out of nowhere sometimes if he catches you sleeping. Mmm, sweet lava cookies. I am curious though, what are these things made of exactly? A homemade edible that instantly cures paralysis, burns, and Poison? For a third of the price of actual medicine? What kind of business are you running here exactly? Moving right along to the Jagged Pass, which we won't be spending much time here. I really love this route as well, if for anything to boost the town of Lava Ridge thematically. I don't really get to explore this place much though, because I pretty much always go for the mock bike over the acro bike for daycare training when I need it. Still, even though my time on this route is usually brief, I always take a second to appreciate the design. After all that traveling up north, we finally make it to Lava Ridge Town. After quickly picking up some charcoal from this man inside the herb shop, I heal up my team and enter the gym. I always love the atmosphere here, and I'm sure my Torkoal feels right at home. Not too far into this episode and it's already time for team review. This team just happened 
happens to be featuring the best possible Pokemon that I can use at the moment, and at a glance, you would think that I had set this up specifically to deal with Flannery. There's just so many good options here, starting with Cast Form. Rain Dance is going to cripple Flannery's fire types. Normally, I run a whole bunch of damage calculations first to get a preview of how the battle will play out, but honestly, I'm thinking I'm just going to skip that for this fight and get some time back. Anyway. Cast form may very well deal with everything other than maybe Torkoal. My own Torkoal is up next, and he'll be making things hot and heavy in more ways than one, as he'll be used to court Flannery's Torkoal. My Torkoal is quite the ladies man, apparently, and Attract will hopefully prove to be very useful here. Minin will be used to Thunder Wave Torkoal if I think I need it. I won't send him in though until Flannery's Ace has overheated at least twice. Encore could potentially be nice here as well if Torkoal goes for Attract, because if that happens, I could then theoretically switch into Soul Rock at that point since it won't be affected by a track. So Viper has Dig. And that's it. <laughs> Still pretty useful though. Soul Rock just matches up incredibly well against Flannery's entire team, both defensively and offensively. And Sableye is bringing up the rear as a last resort. I'm not expecting much resistance here, but let's see if Flannery can catch us off guard. Starting off the fight with Cast Form, I go for the Rain Dance and Nummel goes for Magnitude. The damage is pretty average, so I'm not too worried about it. And as it turns out, that is an understatement, as Cast Form would go on to destroy Flannery's first three Pokemon with ease. Rain Dance boosted Water Guns are apparently enough to take out everything in one shot, including that Camerupt. Her entire team is just so slow as well, so whether or not I moved first was just never going to be a question. <laughs> After Camera Up finally goes down, her Ace Torkoal comes out. My first thought was to go for another Rain Dance so I could be extra ready for a potential switch, but I'm stupid and don't know how the weather effects work in this game. So I did lose out on some initial water gun damage. This was definitely a pretty big mistake as Torkoal's special defense is so much lower than his regular defense. Water gun could have dealt a lot of damage there. Unfortunately for me, the careless mistakes don't end there as I make a series of extremely questionable decisions. I switch my Torkoal in to try to take some overheats, but Flannery's Ace just goes for the Sunny Day instead, which just erases anything my Cast Form tried to do. I follow up with an Attract, but... So does Flannery. And as it turns out, men are far more interested in women than women are in men, because my boy couldn't land anything while Flannery's Torkoal didn't give a flying fuck. Sorry buddy, there are plenty of other volcanic fire turtles on the mountain. Foolish mistake number two comes in as I switch into mine in for some reason, thinking that I could somehow take a body slam and get off a thunder wave without just dying to overheat. Have you ever had a day where your brain just stops working temporarily? Well, that's just me right now. After realizing how dumb I was, I switched back into Torkoal to take an incoming overheat. This was what Torkoal was meant to do in the first place, so I'm okay with this. I threw out a Protect just to see what she would go for in this situation, and it does look like it's another overheat. And now for the cherry on top of this brain dead cake I've been eating for the last couple of minutes. I decided to keep Torkoal in to try to take an additional overheat so the rest of my party would have a much easier time with this monster. And... <sighs> Flannery has officially caught us off guard. Why didn't I just switch into Soul Rock there? I just don't understand why I try to min-max my party like this sometimes, it's not like I didn't have any other options. And of course, I send Soul Rock in now, and what does he do? Oh nothing, just completely wrecks this Torkoal one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I end up winning the fight, great, and with only one death, but it was a death that not only didn't need to happen, but it was Torkoal of all Pokemon. I was really looking forward to using him throughout this playthrough, but I guess I won't have the chance this attempt. Oh great, overheat. That would have been awesome to teach to a certain someone. Man, 
Boxing Torkoal feels so bad. Oh well. Next man up. Welcome back, Yoimize. With my head hanging low, I run over to the desert for some extra training and to pick up the items that can be found there. There's literally nothing else to do other than to train up for Norman in the fifth gym, for which I promise to actually prepare for. I won't be receiving any new encounters during this episode, as the next batch won't come until after I defeat Norman, as well as acquire the HM for Surf and gain access to the eastern side of Hoenn. So I will have to deal with what I've got for right now. I think I've got a solid enough team though. I can pick up the TM for Toxic in just a second, and if you've seen any of my other runs in which I've used Sableye and Solrock, then you'll have a pretty good idea of what I'm planning to do. After picking up the rest of those items, I grab the TM for Toxic and the Fiery Path and finish my training for Norman. Even though it's only a couple of levels, I do get some pretty interesting upgrades for a few team members. The biggest upgrade being Cast Form learning the move Weather Ball, which is essentially a 100 base power fire or water move depending on the weather. And since Cast Form transforms into that same type, he'll get the additional stab bonus as well, effectively making Weather Ball a 150 base power move as long as weather is up. Sableye picks up Faint Attack, which is another nice stab move. Yelimize gets Flatter, which is actually pretty nice for this gym since there are no special attacks. Well, at least not many. And Solrock gets Cosmic Power. I'm not sure if it's worth it or not, but who knows, maybe some defensively focused setup will be useful down the line. As I make my way over to Petalburg to take on Mr. Dad, I figured I would take some time to talk about some of my favorite single stage Pokemon from this game, as well as some of the upcoming encounters I'm looking forward to the most. Sableye is probably my number one out of all the team members I have so far, and in fact, he has very quickly become one of my favorite Pokemon from the Hoenn region in general. Extremely consistent and a total pain in the ass for my opponents, which is a quality I just adore in my favorite Pokemon. I really hope I can keep him around for as long as I can, as he'll He'll be very useful for the upcoming Norman fight, and especially for Tate and Liza. Torkoal is unfortunately one of my other favorites from this region, and it really sucks that I didn't get a chance to show the world what he can really do. Any Pokemon that's super bulky, defensively focused overall, but also has at least one serviceable offensive stat is a Pokemon that I will grow extremely fond of. I was really looking forward to deleting enemies with Overheat, but this attempt was just not the one for my boy Torkoal. While I won't be able to use Skarmory in this attempt, I have to bring him up in this conversation. One of my favorites from Gen 2, and one of the many reasons I fell in love with the Steel type upon its creation. So annoying to deal with, and comes with some really cool and interesting packages. I'm definitely looking forward to a future Emerald Challenge where I'll be forced to use him. And finally, I'd like to give a quick nod to Heracross. Unless you're really into bugs in real life, bug Pokemon can be a bit difficult to love sometimes. Heracross will make you do a double take though. Great type combination, moveset, stats, and theme. I also really love how you acquire him in most games, which is usually by headbutting trees in a specific area. In Emerald though, he's just kinda chillin' in the safari zone. Spoiler alert, as much as I admire Heracross, I ultimately decided to ban him for at least this attempt, and likely the first few if I don't complete this challenge on my first try. I'm only doing this because of how powerful he seems to be on paper, especially for the later sections of the game. This means that my safari zone encounter will be either Pinsir or Giraffery, which I'm still very excited about. I haven't decided yet, but I will say I have not used Pinsir in probably 20 years, literally, so that might be an interesting option. I'm definitely looking forward to see what he can do. I guess I should also bring up real quick that using Tropius and Absol does seem like a lot of fun. As bad as Tropius seems to be on paper. <laughs> so I guess I'm looking forward to those two as well. Let me know who your favorite single stage Pokemon are. I'd be interested to see what you guys think. Already at gym number five. Feels like we made it here pretty quick though. Just another friendly reminder before the team review, these trainers in here suck. I would avoid the left and the middle sections of the gym in my opinion at all costs, as those rooms include a trainer with Sword Stance Zangoose and another with a Dire Hit boosted Vigoroth with Slash. Seriously, I've actually wiped to that Zangoose before, and it just catches you completely off guard. So I went to the right side without any issues, right? I mean, come on, this dude is using a slack off. It's such a joke. Mmm, well, I, uh, wasn't exactly expecting to have a coronary so early into the next episode, but here we are. Just, uh, give me a couple minutes to throw up a little, and then we'll get right into the team review.
It's sad not to see Torko in the party anymore, but luckily our loss won't impact this fight all that much, as the rest of my team is very well equipped to deal with Norman. Leading the charge is Solrock this time, as the only thing Spinda can really do against it is use Teeter Dance and pray that my Solrock kills itself in confusion. I have a Person Berry equipped to mitigate that bit and hopefully keep Solrock a bit healthier. Once Spinda goes down, I'm expecting Vigoroth to come out next and go for a super effective Fate Attack. I'll then switch into Illumise, who's actually got some pretty decent special bulk to take that hit, and the plan from there is to use Charm a few times to weaken Vigoroth as much as possible. I just have to hope he doesn't get lucky with slash crits. From there, I'll switch into cast form to give us our daily forecast and smack Norman's monkey around with Weather Paw. It should be a very easy to hit KO. When Linoon finally comes out, I'll switch into Sableye to completely wall it. Linoon is normally a very dangerous threat to deal with as it is super fast and comes packed with belly drum, but luckily Sableye doesn't care about normal type moves, so so Linoon is essentially a free fight. Sableye will also be dealing with Norman's ace as well, as usual. <laughs> It's Pokemon like Sableye that make what are normally extremely tough fights look super easy. And finally in the back we've got Minin and Seviper, who are going to be backups for Vigoroth primarily if Cast Form gets crit or something like that. Minin does have some pretty awesome backup utility as well if I need it. I can't believe we're already halfway through the game. It's been a fun ride so far and I'm really looking forward to a bunch of new encounters after this. But first, we've got some business to take care of. Let's do this. I send out Soul Rock to take on Norman's Spinda. While I was pretty confident that Rock Throw would kill in two hits, I wasn't entirely sure. Luckily, I don't have to think about it anymore because the crit lands and Spinda goes down immediately. Great start. Vigoroth comes out next, and I know that a crit from Faint Attack won't be enough to take Soul Rock out, so I stay in to get some extra Rock Throw damage in. This actually works out perfectly because now Cast Form's Weather Ball will only have to land once instead of twice, which means one less turn that I have to avoid a crit. The Faint Attack doesn't do much, and now I switch into Illumise to try and lower Vigoroth's attack a little bit. After all the close calls and misplays I've had recently, I don't want to take any chances if I can help it. Vigoroth's Faint Attack doesn't deal a whole lot of damage, and I have Illumise throw out a charm. Facade does deal a bit more now, and I'm a little worried about the crit. This should be plain enough for Cast Form to come in and finish the job anyway. So Cast Form comes in and sets up the Rain Dance. It didn't really matter what condition I used here, as Weather Ball was going to deal the same amount of damage regardless. Vigoroth throws out a slash on his second attack, and no crit. Very nice. And Cast Form is still very healthy. And, since he's still so healthy, I keep him in against Linoon. Linoon can't kill with this much health still left on cast form, so I can definitely get at least one hit in. Also, how the hell am I faster than Linoon? That's actually kinda crazy, it must have had a nature that it lowers speed. Cast form isn't slow, but he's not faster than Linoon. Whatever. Doesn't make any sense, but hey, it worked out for us. And fortunately, Linoon also goes for the belly drum, and it of course fails after the weather ball landed. And now that I know we're faster, I just simply toss out another weather ball to finish the job. Now, all that's left is Norman's ace, slacking, and I've got the perfect answer. I switch into Sableye as slacking goes for a useless counter. I throw out fake out because I'm stupid, but luckily I can afford to make a ton of mistakes here, as there isn't much that slacking can do against Sableye. Even if and when I use Detect at the wrong time, a faint attack is just not going to be all that threatening. The Toxic lands on the first try, and now we stall. This is a pretty typical setup, and I'm sure you guys have seen this plenty of times, so I'll skip ahead a bit. Norman would go on to use both of his Hyper Potions, and he did sneak in a single faint attack, because I forgot that Slacking will actually loaf around after getting healed, which essentially gives me multiple free turns to let Toxic do its thing. But it didn't matter, and Dad's career is officially over. Does that mean I get to take over the gym now? I guess not. Oh well, it was worth a try. On to getting the HM for Surf, and I hate when Pokemon games do this to the music. You do not need to change the music to something completely random and just flat out worse for 5 seconds as we walk all of 12 steps to the left. Just keep playing the music, Petalburg's theme is great. All the themes in this game are great. 
Now that we have the HM for Surf, we're going to need to catch an HM slave to help us traverse the newly opened water routes. As no one on the team now can learn it, and I don't think I'll be getting an encounter that can learn it until after Badge 7. Which actually sucks now that I think about it, because that would have been really helpful for Tate and Liza. With our token Goldie now on the team, it's time to start trekking towards Winona and Fortree City. I have boxed Ilamize for now, as he won't be super necessary for any of the fights coming up. Although, I might change my mind if I think I need a charm user for our rival's mark top on Route 119. While we travel the long road to Fortree, I think this is a good time to talk about all the different routes, areas, and items that make up this section of the mid-game. Let's start with the optional water route up north. Route 115. For me, this route is typically not worth it in most of my runs, specifically because of how scary the random trainers are here. You've got a pretty bulky Machoke and Hariyama on this route, both of which have counter. The Dodrio and Kadabra that some of the other trainers have should also not be slept on either. The items that you get on this route are just very niche, I would say. I don't really know exactly how I feel about Focus Punch. I haven't really used it enough to know if it's good in a Nuzlocke setting or not. Let me know in the comments if you found success with it, outside of combining it with Spore Breloom, of course. I will say though that this route does give you a 50% chance of obtaining Talo or Swellow if you happen to miss that encounter on one of the early routes. In that case, it may very well be worth it. Other than that, I think this may be the only route in the game that provides Kelpsy Berries, which are essential if you plan on using Milotic in your run. But again, that's a super niche scenario that's not going to be very common. Heading back south through Rustboro and Petalburg Woods, it's time to travel along routes 105, 106, 107, 108, and 109. And for so many routes, there's not too much to see here in general. Even though this supposedly provides the player with several new encounters, there are only three Pokemon that you can actually catch between all of them, and you've most likely already caught each one by that point anyway. I guess that's the unfortunate part of having both Surf and Dive in the same game, and it's probably the reason why Game Freak has never brought the diving mechanic back. You have to have enough water Pokemon to accommodate both environments, but you also can't inflate the Pokedex too much with water types at the same time. That must have been a pretty difficult balance to strike, honestly. Although, a part of me still wishes there was just a little bit more variety with the amount of water you traverse in the later stages of the game. There's not too much to talk about as far as items go either on these routes, just mostly vitamins, heart scales, and some other miscellaneous stuff like that. The two biggest upgrades between all of these particular routes has to be the Sludge Bomb, which you can get from the man inside Duford Hall in Duford Town, and of course the TM for Ice Beam, which can be found by navigating through the abandoned ship on Route 108. The abandoned ship is definitely the highlight of the southwestern water routes. It's pretty fun to explore for the most part, and it's also not too big, so it doesn't feel like a slog to get through. I find the layout to be far more interesting than the SSN, for example, even though it's way smaller. And that concludes our tour of the western water routes. Back in Slateport again, and not much to see here on our return. So I'm gonna head straight to Mauville for the next little side mission. Upon entering Mauville again, I meet up with Watson in the middle of town to pick up a little quest to go investigate New Mauville, which is essentially a bunker at this point beneath the city. This quest is obviously fantastic because you get the TM for Thunderbolt at the end, and that's a really big theme for this section of the game. Surf, Sludge Bomb, Ice Beam, and Thunderbolt just one after the other. It's amazing. You can also consider that you'll also probably have enough cash to pick up another incredible TM for the game corner as well, just adding to that unbelievable mix. I head over to New Mauville to quickly deal with the generator and obtain a Thunderbolt for our mining. While there's not a whole lot to do in this place, I will say it is a pretty good grinding spot if you're not using the daycare method. Magnemite and Voltorb grant pretty decent experience and are fairly easy to take down depending on what type of Pokemon you have, but that's about the extent of New Mauville's usefulness. There is a Thunderstone in here, but your only target for it is Pikachu, which isn't even a guaranteed encounter in the Safari. Zone. The puzzles aren't super interesting either, I guess. Everything about this place is just kind of meh. Thank you very much, sir. And now, we can finally head over to Route 118 and begin our expedition of the eastern side of Hoenn. Route 118 is a very tiny route that makes up the beach outside of Mauville, a tiny, tiny bit of water, and a patch of grass here and there on the other side. Despite this being one of the smallest routes in the game, there are a few really cool items and features here. The first being the good rod as soon as you land on the other side of the pond. This unlocks some really cool new water encounters, such as Carvana and Whalmer. And after you randomly encounter 
or Steven for a little chat, you could pick up your first citrus berries in the region, which always feels nice. Route 118 is also the home of our next encounter, which it's about damn time. It feels like we got Soul Rock ages ago. And that new encounter is Kecleon. I have completed several Nuzlocke of the Generation 3 games at this point, and I have yet to actually utilize this guy. A very strange Pokemon, Kecleon has one of the most unique abilities in color change. Normally it's not very effective if used against a player, but against AI? It's definitely interesting, and I'm definitely going to try him out this time. Kecleon's stats are pretty decent too, although I wish he was made as more of a special attacker than physical, because he gets so many great coverage options if you want them. I'll have to really think about which way I want to commit with him offensively. Route 119 is next, and unlike Route 118, this area is enormous. There are a ton of trainers to battle and items to pick up, although most of the items are skippable, I suppose. I really do enjoy both Route 119 and 120. Their themes are great, and the terrain is varied and interesting. The constant rain in certain spots really adds to this, as well as the battles, too. The tall grass used to annoy me as a kid because I couldn't run or bike through it. I was, uh, very impatient. <laughs> but nowadays, I appreciate how much it mixes things up a bit from the previous routes, not just in Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, but from Gens 1 and 2 as well. Route 119 also contains two of Hoenn's single-stage Pokemon in Tropius and, of course, Cast Form. One of the biggest reasons why I went with Cast Form as my starter was so that I wouldn't have to choose between him and Tropius. I wanted to be able to use them both, and this was the best way to do it. With that being said, let's welcome said Tropius to the team. Tropius is another Pokemon that I have not used all that much because, on paper, he's garbage. But I've also said that about Sableye in the past and was proven wrong when I actually got to use him in practice. So I'm hoping the same thing happens with Tropius. What makes Tropius tough to like is the combination of his horrible defensive typing, his lack of speed, and his terrible offensive stats. And he doesn't even get any interesting coverage options either. So basically everything is just bad or mediocre at best. However, he is very bulky, and while his typing is generally bad defensively, there are a decent amount of matchups in this game that allow him to dodge those weaknesses. And while his speed is terrible, he does get Chlorophyll as an ability, which synergizes nicely with what our cast form is trying to accomplish as well. Man, if this thing got Leech Seed via level up instead of as an egg move, that would have pushed him to the next level for sure. Before I head over to the Weather Institute, I grab the Citrus Berries under the first bridge, and I actually backtrack to Route 118 for a quick pit stop. From Route 118, I head slightly east to the Berry Master's house, where I flat out pillage this poor family's garden and use it to start my own Citrus Berry farm. Sorry, not sorry. Seriously though, this is always a good little detour to take to stock up on the best held item you can get before the post game. Now back on Route 119, and it's time to quickly clear out the Weather Institute, which is never much of a challenge. This place is pretty cool, I just wish they did more with it honestly. Well this is awkward. I'm just gonna... I'm, I'm just gonna take this. They probably don't want this thing back, right? And after releasing a man-made creation that can control the weather out into the wild, I completely ruined our rival's life and finally made it to the wonderful Four Tree City. This place was every kid's dream. Who didn't want to live in a village full of treehouses? I guess I just have a soft spot for towns that heavily integrate themselves into their natural surroundings. I take a quick stroll through town and head out the other side to grab the Devon Scope from Steven. Yep, that's my, uh, my legendary battle style you've been so curious about this whole time. Thought about how my team is currently constructed, and I was originally going to explore the other routes before I took on Winona. However, looking at the few encounters I could get, they aren't really going to be all that useful for this particular gym. So with the Devon Scope now in hand, I begin my preparations for Winona and her flying types. I'll meet you guys over there for the team review. 
all trained up and ready for Winona. Overall, I'm feeling pretty good about this one. I think the lineup I've got here is solid. To start the fight, I'm going with Cast Form. Ice Beam will probably be the only button I press, and Cast Form will be using it to take out Winona Swablu and then potentially Altaria and or Tropius. I do have plenty of options though, so it really depends on who Winona wants to send out as her second Pokemon. Next up is Kecleon, and as you can see, I have turned him into a special attacker to take advantage of all that coverage and his quiet nature. This might be the first time I've had two Ice Beam users on the team for Winona, so you can imagine why I'm pretty happy with our chances going into this fight. Just like Cast Form, chances are I'll be hitting that Ice Beam button and nothing else. And again, depending on when Winona sends in Altaria, Kecleon will be available to take it out if Cast Form cannot. Soul Rock comes in as our ultimate contingency plan for Altaria. If something goes horribly wrong and I cannot use Cast Form or Kecleon, Soul Rock is very well equipped to deal with Winona's ace, having a very favorable defensive typing against all of Altaria's attacks. Our fourth team member is Minin, and he'll be used to take out Skarmory and Pelipper. His modest nature actually comes in huge here, as Thunderbolt should actually be a one-hit KO on Skarmory. Having Charm here is nice as well if I need it for Skarmory for whatever reason, but it just seems unlikely. Sableye and Seviper are the backups, but to be honest, neither can really be super helpful for the majority of this fight. Seviper in particular just doesn't match up well against anything other than Tropius, which I don't think I'll ever need a backup for. Sableye can at least Toxic Stall something if it's absolutely needed. Let's see what Winona has in store for us this time. I lead with Cast Form and go for the Ice Beam. And it doesn't kill. It actually didn't even come close, which surprised me. But I think I also just got it in my head that Swablu was part dragon just like its evolution, but no, that's not the case, so Ice Beam is only two times effective. Luckily, the aerial ace that came out wasn't too much of an issue, but that could have been a big problem if Parish Song had come out instead. Winona decides to send in Tropius next, and surely Ice Beam will one-shot this time, right? Well, no, apparently it doesn't. Tropius is a pretty bulky Pokemon, but still, a quad effective Ice Beam from pretty much any Pokemon that's four levels higher should take this thing down. But I guess we may have gotten to the point in the run where Cast Form's shortcomings come into focus a bit more. Tropius ended up going for the Solar Beam though, which means it locks itself out from any healing that Winona could have provided, so another Ice Beam brings him down. Pelipper comes out next, and I switch into Mining. Pelipper's entire strategy revolves around using Supersonic to set up confusion and then protect to basically be as annoying as humanly possible without de actually dealing a whole lot of damage. However, this damage that I could take from Confusion may actually matter though. Not for this fight against Pelipper, he's straight up doomed. But if I do take a little bit of damage from Confusion, when Altaria eventually comes in, it might see a kill with Earthquake and go for that instead of Dragon Dance. Switching into either Cast Form or Kecleon on an Earthquake instead of a Dragon Dance would not be ideal. With all of that being said though, Minin completely shrugs off Pelipper's entire strategy and doesn't get hit a single time, despite the double protect as well. All I need was one Thunderbolt to connect, and once it did, Pelipper finally went down. Winona's ace finally comes out and I switch into Kecleon. Altaria goes for the Dragon Dance as expected, and then follows that up with an Earthquake. Time to see if this Ice Beam can kill in one hit. According to my calculations, it looks like a range. It doesn't quite get there, and Altaria's Orenberry pops. Quick side note on that, by the way, why does Winona's Ace use an Orenberry while most of the others use a Citrus Berry? I guess Game Freak thought that Winona was pretty tough too, I guess. After the Hyper Potion from Winona, I use another Ice Beam, and this time, I hit the range and Altaria goes down. All that's left is the Skarmory, and so I switch into Minin to take the incoming Steel Wing. One more Thunderbolt later, and Winona falls, giving us our 6th gym badge and the TM for Aerial Ace. An all around great performance from the team.
With our newest gym badge in hand, we've got quite a lot of exploring to do between now and our next boss fight. I head back to the Pokemon Center to heal up the team and say goodbye to two of our team members. For now at least. Solrock and Seviper are the least needed for the immediate challenges ahead of us, and I also wanted to play around with some other Pokemon. To replace them, Tropius will be joining the squad as our flyer, as well as our next encounter. Heading out of Fortree to the east is Route 120, where we can catch ourselves in Absol. Absol is a lot of things, honestly. Perhaps the edgiest Pokemon in the series, with a Pokedex entry that refers to it as the Disaster Pokemon. Which is really cool and interesting, but has it ever been explained why you can find one on Route 120? Like, is there a particular significance to this route that I'm just not aware of? Pokemon with that kind of title deserves a little bit more backstory in my opinion. And I mean, look at him. Absol looks like it could have been a part of a legendary trio or something. While that's all fun to think about, what does Absol bring to the table for our run? While as many of you know already, the absence of the physical special split doesn't do us any favors here. But while Absol's overall move pool is incredibly limited, you can scrummage up enough to make good use out of Absol's huge attack stat. Slash, Shadow Ball, and Aerial Ace are all pretty decent options. I haven't decided what I want to do for that fourth move slot yet though. The obvious choice would be Swords Dance of course, but I'd like to avoid using it if I can. The only real setup strategy that I completely ban from my runs involves the use of any move that raises your Pokemon's evasion, like Double Team or Minimize. I think I'd like to officially throw Swords Dance into that mix as well, unless the challenge I'm currently doing is so difficult that it would be impossible to complete without it. And that goes for the evasion strategies as well. I don't mind using those things as long as they're totally necessary, or if I had to risk too many crits for comfort. In general, I'd like to continue to allow all other setup moves though in my runs, but perhaps I'll only restrict myself to using them on a single team member. That way, I can still use the strategy if I want to, but without making every single run I go through just like a setup fest. Even without Swords Dance, I believe that with proper training and usage, Absol will still be able to dish out some serious hell on our future opponents. I trained up our Absol in attack and speed, while I went for more of a defensive approach with Tropius. Absol also has an adamant nature, which is fantastic, but I'll have to be careful with how I use him, because I can't remember the last time I've used a Pokemon this frail. There's not too much to go over with Route 120 for this particular challenge, with the only really useful pickup being the TM for Sunny Day on the Scorched Slab. It could come in handy later on. Otherwise, while I love this route visually and thematically, I tend to skip it very often because this is another very dangerous path to take head on. If you're playing Emerald, you'll want to watch out for Ace Trainer Lionel and his Manectric. This Manectric has Thunder, and need I remind you that it's constantly raining on this route, so this Thunder will never miss. I usually tend to avoid all the trainers I can on this route, and just move on to the more mechanically interesting routes that come after. But for this playthrough, I decided to give this fight a go. And it goes way better than I could have expected, with Kecleon flexing on this thing with a critical slash. Try Trust me, that fight usually goes a bit differently. I blow through the rest of Route 120 and take on a bunch of the trainers over on Route 121. I'm looking to make a quick stop in Lily Cove so I can pick up some items and visit the Pokemon Center so I can get that flight path. The trainers on this route are not all that interesting for the most part, but with the Amulet Quinn equipped, I am more than happy to take their money. But what is interesting about this route is the presence of the Safari Zone, where we'll be getting our next encounter, hopefully. Safari Zone encounters are always a little bit annoying to obtain. I have three possible encounters here in Heracross, Pinsir, and Girafferig, and I get my choice of which one I want as well, as they can be encountered in completely different areas of the Safari Zone. Now, if you remember earlier in the series, I did say that I would ban Heracross for the first few attempts, as he is clearly the obvious choice out of these three, and I'm gonna stick with that plan. I've already had pretty great success with Girafferig in the past, but Heracross is on another level, and would certainly make my life a lot easier. With that being said, since I have used that giraffe rig in a recent run, and I have not used Pinsir since Pokemon Blue version, I'm gonna go with Pinsir for this run, even though he fills basically the same role as Absol for the most part. Although, looking into Pinsir a bit more, he honestly seems like he might have an edge on our newest team member. He's got just as much attack, he is so, so much bulkier, and he's even faster. Pinsir's ability in Hypercutter is actually a lot more useful as well, preventing other Pokemon from lowering his best stat. Wait, 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 wait. This thing gets Brick Break via Level Up and has access to Bulk Up and Earthquake? All right, well on paper, it looks like Pinsir's got Absol pretty badly in this generation after all, 
These are some sweet moves. I'm getting ahead of myself though. I need to actually use him for a bit before I can pass judgment. And to see how he stacks up against the rest of the boss fights in the game too. The dark typing from Absol is probably more useful than Bug in the long run. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't excited to use this guy. And in addition to Pinsir, we also pick up the TM for Solar Beam, which is also pretty neat, I guess. From the Safari Zone, I head south to Route 122 and 123, where I can pick up a few more items and train a bit more. Remember when I said Route 118 was one of the shortest routes in the game? Well, 122 has it beat, I think, at least in terms of being the most barren. They honestly could have just considered the water route surrounding Mount Pyre as part of Mount Pyre, but I guess that would technically give us Nuzlocke's less encounters. Not that we really need the extra water encounter anyway though. The chances of not having all of the Pokemon you can catch on this route is pretty slim by this point in the game. On Route 123, we can pick up some pretty great berries of the Citrus and Lepa variety, and we can actually grab the TM for Giga Drain in this run because I actually have a grass type on the team. I guess by default it would go to Tropius, but I'd rather it go on something else with a bit more offensive firepower if possible. Other other than a rare candy and a couple of PP ups, Route 123 is already finished. It's a nice little connector route, but there's not a whole lot that stands out as far as the surroundings go. It's very hilly. I guess, but not in as interesting of a way compared to like the Jagged Pass for example. Moving right along to a very interesting place in Mount Pyre. One of, if not the best Pokemon tower in the series for me. It has a fantastic theme, challenging trainers, Boba Fett's give me anxiety, and some incredible items to pick up in Shadow Ball, Sea Incense, Lax Incense, Skill Swap, just so many great things are in here. The summit is a nice contrast compared to the inside of the tower, and the fact that the story ties into this place as well makes it feel a lot more important than some of the other towers do. After reaching the summit and dealing with Archie and some old people, no I will not listen to your story again, I almost forgot our newest encounter. Atop this mountain of pyre, we can pick ourselves up a Chimeco. Chimeco doesn't have the highest of base stat totals, but it does use its stats pretty efficiently. Plus, it's a special attacker, which I think we may need a bit more of on our side. The move pool kind of sucks though, but Chimeco's got a bit of utility that might make up for that. I head back to Lily Cove to heal up and deal with our rival one last time. The last fight with your rival may be the most insulting part of this whole game. Why did Game Freak make them so bad? A Slugma and a Tropius, who are some of the worst Pokemon in the game? Actually, Slugma may be the worst now that I think about it. Their starter doesn't fully evolve, and his moveset on Ludicolo makes me cry tears of pain. Not to mention only four Pokemon? I'll never understand this decision, especially in the third game of the generation. Like, you had a chance to fix this, but you still messed it up. Now that all of the new routes are cleared out, it's time to take on both of the evil teams, starting with the Team Magma hideout within the Jagged Pass. The only thing this place is great for is farming wild Pokemon for some pretty great experience per hour. Plus, it's probably the best spot in the game for gaining defense EVs if you're looking to bulk up some of your team members. But I'm not about doing any of that right now, so let's get into a quick team review for Maxi. I'm leading off with Pinsir to take on Maxi's Mightyena one-on-one. -on -one. Pinsir is very well equipped to deal with what Mightyena has. Hyper Cutter will cancel out the Intimidate, Brick Break is super effective, and I'm having Pinsir hold a Person Berry, which will essentially net us a free attack boost if Mightyena decides to go for Swagger. Cast Form is here to take out Maxi's Ace Camerupt with a Rain Dance boosted Weather Ball. How will I be able to get Cast Form in and pull that off safely? Well, you'll see. Kecleon is up next and he should be able to take out Crobat without too much of an issue. He is also holding a Person Berry to mitigate that Confuse Ray. Minin will be used as a backup for Kecleon on Crobat mostly, and that's about it. Tropius could be used on Camerupt if something goes really wrong, but I'm not sure if he'll be able to do much. I can pretty reliably switch him in on an Earthquake, but his offensive stats are so poor that I'm not sure it'll matter. I probably should have just brought Soul Rock, honestly. Not sure why I didn't. And last, but not least, we say goodbye to this poor, poor creature. I'm sorry, Spinda. Another run where I don't use you at all. Maybe one day. He will be used here as a strategic sacrifice on Camerupt to safely switch in my cast form. Can I get through Maxi with an underleveled team? I don't know, but let's find out. I lead with Pinsir to take this dark puppy down. The first brick break deals a ton, and then a scary face comes in to cripple our speed.
Not bad for us at all though, as we will not be using Pinsir for anything else in this fight. Maxi heals up Mightyena with a super potion, which I mean, come on, surely a man possessing a status equivalent to that of a mob boss would afford something a little more, I don't know, useful? I go for another Brick Break, but then Maxi actually decides to switch into Crobat, which is actually a pretty interesting move. I don't think I've ever seen him do that before, at least in this particular battle. I switch into Minin to take the incoming wing attack, and Crobat is of course faster, so we do get hit with a Confuse Ray and hit ourselves in confusion. Luckily, our Citrus Berry gets some great use here, and we are able to try for one last Thunderbolt before we'll be forced to switch out. And luckily, the Thunderbolt lands, taking out Crobat. Naturally, Maxi sends in his ace camera up next, and I'm sure we'll see a pretty meaty earthquake here. And so... Sorry, Spinda. I have reasons, okay? I'm sorry. Don't look at me like that. Camera ups goes for that earthquake and oh, oh god. Oh, oh no. This is a disaster. Oh, oh Jesus. <laughs> Farewell, Spinda. One day I'll use you, I promise. I'm sorry you had to die that way. Casform can now come in and set up his rain dance. And for some reason, Camerupt goes for the Amnesia. Like, I get what you're going for there, buddy, but I'm sorry, a 200 base power water move could probably still take out two of you, even with the special defense buff. With Camerupt down and out, Maxi sends out his Mightyena, and I just keep Castform in to finish the job since he's still at full health. That's Maxi number two in the books. I took some time to level up the team in preparation for our next big challenge over in Moss Deep City. And this is what it looks like at the moment. I'm gonna be benching cast form for now, I think, as I won't require his services at this very moment, but he should be back at some point. I'll also have to bench someone else here as well to make room for our Goldeen, since I won't be getting another encounter that learns Surf until after I defeat Tate and Liza. Most likely Pinsir, I suppose. Only because he lacks special bulk, and there's a lot of water ahead of us. Sableye and Absol are crucial for the Tate and Liza fight, so they've gotta stick around for a bit until then. I would would not at all be surprised if Absol's able to one-shot some stuff with that ridiculous attack stat. Time to move on, and we're looking to deal with Team Aqua and whatever it is they're trying to do here. I wish there was a little bit more going on with this part of the story. This is probably the exact moment in the game where I feel like everything starts to feel a little rushed. Like we've been here for 15 seconds and we're already on the move again. This wouldn't be so bad if we maybe did this a few more times on the way over to the Aqua hideout. Speaking of which, this place is so uninteresting. If it weren't for the acquisition of the Master Ball, the Team Aqua hideout would be straight up useless. And I still don't understand why they had to make all the Aqua Grunts incredibly weak. Give them some Mighty Annas at least, jeez. I ran through a bunch of routes not long ago where they were just running wild. After finishing off this pitiful man, we can now traverse all of the water everyone complains about. There's not much I want to cover here this time around. I'll save that for after Tate and Liza when we can pick up our next few encounters. These routes are pretty boring though, I suppose. There's just not a whole lot of interesting items to gather or trainers to battle. The rematches are actually pretty interesting, but in a challenge like this, it's not really something I tend to go for. Maybe in a future challenge I can force myself to complete specific rematches or something. Since there is nothing left to do at this point, I head over to Moss Deep City, pick up the free King's Rock, thank you very much, and enter the seventh gym. Another Wobbuffet alert here. Don't forget about it or you might be totally screwed. Luckily, Sableye eats Wobbuffets for breakfast, so I can sleep peacefully tonight. Let's get into the team review. This one should be pretty straightforward with our dynamic dark type duo. Absol is going to crush everything into dust. Shadow Ball will hit crazy hard, and two of Tate and Liza's Pokemon can't even hit him. I've given Absol a Person Berry to shut off any confusion that comes our way. And following that up with his partner in crime, our old friend Sableye. Sableye will also be impossible to hit, and will wreak just as much havoc on the battlefield. As long as I focus down their Clay Doll and Soul Rock, it's pretty much over. He is also holding a Person Berry, again to deal with that Confuse Ray from Zatu. Every other team member is simply a backup, but I don't think I'll need them, honestly. 
Cast form and Minum especially are just a bit too squishy for this, but even if I didn't have Absol or Sableye, Tropius and Kecleon are pretty well equipped to deal with this fight as well. Already at badge number 7. Let's do this. I leave with my dark types and start pressing that shadow ball button. The goal is to focus down the Claydol first, as he is their biggest threat in my opinion. Absol deals a ton of damage and then Zatu naturally moves second, but only uses a Calm Mind, which won't help them much in this situation. But then... Holy crap, thank god that didn't crit. For some reason I got it into my head that Sableye would be faster. And oh boy was I super wrong about that. Claydol is actually a lot faster than I would have thought. Luckily we aren't punished for it and Claydol does go down. On the next turn, again I was taken by surprise though with yet another Pokemon I thought would be slower than Sableye. Zatu sets up the Sunny Day and Solrock moves before Sableye. Again, another Pokemon that is not as slow as you think it is. But for some reason it goes for a Sunny Day of its own, which makes no sense whatsoever. That setup that Tate and Liza just had there was perfect. The Sunny Day was set up and that Solrock could have easily just used Solar Beam or Flamethrower and my Absol could have been toast. I know Solrock's special attack is basically non-existent, so maybe Absol could have lived anyway, but still, super sloppy plays on my part. With only Zatu and Lunatone left, there's really nothing Tate and Liza can do now but beg for their Pokemon's lives. With several more Shadow Balls later, the twins finally go down, giving us our 7th Gym Badge and the TM for Calm Mind, which I'm gonna try not to use if I can help it. With our new badge in hand, it's time to deal with Team Magma again at the Space Center. Seriously, you guys are being pushed around by a dude with nothing but a ball toy? Again, this sequence is a little too short and Maxi becomes a whole lot easier in a double battle setting, especially when his partner is... not very intimidating to say the least. Steven and I make quick work of them, and now we get to the good part. I head over to Steven's house to pick up a very exciting item, the HM for Dive. Why is this exciting? Because we have just unlocked our next three encounters. Let's go over them right now. Route 124 is our first stop to pick up the first legitimate water encounter of the whole run. Jesus, it's taken this long to finally get our hands on one. It takes quite a while as our encounter there has a 5% chance to appear and it takes forever to swim around underwater, but eventually we run into a relicant. I have literally never used this thing, not even once, so I'm very curious to see how it will perform in the late game. This one appears to have Swift Swim, which isn't too bad I suppose, but Rockhead just seems like it's more fun. We do get Double Edge in this game, so... But it does have some synergy with Cast Form, I guess. Water Rock isn't the best type combination, though, and unfortunately the move pool is pretty limited here as well. But the stats are decent, and Relicanth does come with Stab Ancient Power, which is cool. I'm not exactly sure where he fits into the team just yet. We'll have to see how he matches up against the next few fights. For encounter number two, we'll have to head all the way over to Route 128, close to Evergrande City, and it is here that we can pick up Corsola, yet another rock-water type combo. I could have sworn that Corsola was a dive encounter, but I guess not. And why does it require a super rod? It's not the worst Pokemon, but there's nothing super about it either. Corsola has always been viewed as fairly weak, I would say, by the community overall, at least from what I've seen. But it does get Recover, and the usual Surf Ice Beam water package. Unfortunately, I can't teach him Toxic though, as I've already given that to Sableye, so not sure what I can use it for yet. It is a light screen slash reflect user, as I'm just finding out though, so maybe that'll work. You know, looking at all that we have to play around with, 
I'm starting to realize that most of our Pokemon are slow as all hell. That's definitely our weakest side to work with and the most challenging to overcome. And since we're already in the area, let's go grab our last encounter in Evergrande City. It's honestly pretty lucky that we don't actually have to use the HM for Waterfall to grab this encounter. Although, what's not lucky is that it's a love disc, which might be the worst encounter we've received this entire run. Yeah, love disc is really only good for farming hard scales and that's about it. Atrocious stats and pretty standard water-based set with nothing weird or out of the ordinary to set itself apart from anything else. This is our next strategic sacrifice if it's needed. I work on clearing out the rest of the water routes to help level up the party and pick up some random items along the way. I also stop by Sutopolis to grab the flight path and grab some other nice upgrades as well. The TM for Brick Break is always nice and I took the opportunity to teach Double Edge to Relicanth as well, as again, his move pool is super limited and he doesn't learn Double Edge via level up until 57, which is not only far too late, but it's also over the level cap anyway for the Pokemon League. And lastly, before I go through the remaining story we have left, I'm gonna go spend some time training up Relicanth and company for the upcoming challenges. All leveled up and ready to take on the Seafloor Cavern. While leveling up Relicanth and Corsola in the daycare, I got an egg, which was surprisingly the first time that's actually happened to me by accident. Obviously, we're not going to use it or anything, but I thought it was really funny and kept it. Maybe I'll hatch it at the end of the run. Put your guess as to what it is in the comments. Bonus points if you get the moveset too. I can't really explain why, but I'm feeling a little weird about the team right now. Like, even just battling against random trainers, and especially after that awkward Tate Liza fight, I'm starting to get a little concerned about the lack of speed. I don't know, I'm probably just overthinking it, honestly. Things definitely seem like they're getting tougher, though. Finally made it to our destination below the ocean. As usual, this place is generally a breeze with not a whole lot going on outside of the TM for Earthquake and the battle against Archie, both of which are naturally saved for the very end. At least we'll be able to actually use this move for once. I'm pretty sure the last time I actually got to use Earthquake effectively was in the Emerald walkthrough. God, I hate that I need Rock Smash for this place, it's so annoying. And after grabbing said TM, it's time for a quick team review before Archie. Relicanth will be leading the way, and I'm very excited to finally use one for real. He stacks up super nicely against Archie's entire team, basically resisting almost everything and having type advantage in some spots. I'll use him to take down Mightyana primarily, but if I need to switch him back in on anything else, he should be able to get the job done. Our other rock water friend is up next, and I'll be using Corsola to take out Crobat with Ice Beam. Again, the typing just matches up well against basically everything that Archie has, so so yeah. And up next we've got Tropius, who I will be using to finish off Archie's ace with Giga Drain. If I get crit by that slash, then I can easily switch back into Relicanth or Corsola and they can easily clean everything up. Cast Form, Sableye, and Cacleon are going to watch. <laughs> I don't think I'll be needing them honestly. Come on Archie, surprise me. Well, uh, I, I mean, let's just say Archie did not surprise me. The Intimidate comes out from Archie's Mightyena, but the attack reduction is then immediately erased with a Swagger. My Personberry sheds the confusion, and now my Relicanth can hit things quite hard now. Ancient Power comes out and deals a ton of damage, and after the quick Super Potion from Archie, another one brings his best friend down. Since I've still got that attack boost, and I'm at full HP, and Crobat is out, I just go for another Ancient Power. The Confuse Ray comes in, but apparently Relicanth is unfazed. Yeah, I mean, being over 100 million years old, he's probably seen it all and just doesn't care anymore. Ancient Power just decimates everyone's favorite purple bat. And finally, Sharpedo comes out, and he's even more useless than the previous two. After the Mist Screech, and Relicanth just shrugging off another Confusion turn, Archie goes down. And as I'm reading my script back again, this may be the first time that the team review is longer than the actual battle. 
With Team Aqua now out of the way, it's story time. Archie and Maxi messed up bad, legendaries fight, Steven takes me on a field trip, Wallace says some stuff, I arrived at Sky Pillar, awoke Mr. Ray Ray, watched the, the, the thing, and then finally landing back on that sweet Sutopolis melody. Other than wrapping everything up with these fine gentlemen here, I've already done everything that I needed to do within the city. So let's get right into the team review for Juan. The team actually looks pretty good going into this one, with several different routes I could take to bring down Kingdra. I'm leading with Minin to swiftly take out Juan's Love Disk with a Thunderbolt. This should bait out his Whizcash next, as Earthquake will be tempting for him to use. From there, I'll switch into Tropius, who will ignore that Earthquake if it does happen. And if he doesn't, there's not much else Whizcash can really do anyway, even if he decides to bulk up with some Amnesias. Once Whizcash goes down, I'm expecting either Celio or Kingdra next, and it's probably going to be random since neither will see a kill on Tropius with either of their respective ice moves. If it's Celio, I'll probably just go back into Minin. That way, I could potentially have Minin for at least a turn against Kingdra when Celio is out of the way. Leading off with a Thunder Wave against Kingdra will make things much, much more annoying for Juan, at least for a little bit. Once Kingdra comes out, I have several options I can go for. I could try to just go for some simple direct damage, bringing him down with a combination of all of my Pokemon. This approach isn't too bad, honestly, given that I have a Corsola on the team. I can heal up with Recover for quite a while before Kingdra would truly become a big issue. And I have Miraco as well for some big swing potential. I could also go down the route of stalling Kingdra's power point by switching between Tropius and Corsola. Or I could switch into Sableye for a classic Toxic stall. That'll probably be the worst case scenario though. I have Kecleon here to assist with that direct damage strat, and his color change ability is actually really good against Kingdra. And finally, Cast Form can set up Sunny Day to weaken Wan's water attacks. And that's it for the most part, honestly. I may end up not using him, but we'll see how the fight progresses. One more batch to go. Let's see how this plays out. Minin comes in, outspeeds Love Disk, and the Thunderbolt kills. Juan goes for Whizcash next, as expected, and so I switch it to Tropius to potentially negate an incoming Earthquake. Luckily, it was an Earthquake, and now that Tropius is cleanly switched in, it's time to go for some Giga Drains. In retrospect, Magical Leaf would have probably just been better. The damage that Water Pulse could have done to us was going to be so negligible that I don't even think it was worth it to use that Giga Drain PP. Although, I did have Tropius hold a Lepa Berry, effectively giving Giga Drain 16 PP, so I guess it doesn't matter too much. Before Whizcash went down, it decided to use Rain Dance instead of Water Pulse, which was definitely the smart move there from Juan. Not only will that boost his Pokemon's water moves, but it'll double Kingdra's speed as well. Luckily, we don't see that Kingdra just yet, as Celio comes out now. I'm anticipating the Aurora Beam here, so I switch into Minin to take the hit. I would normally be a little bit worried about the potential Water Pulse damage, but Minin is just too strong for the Celio to deal with. Another Thunderbolt brings him down. Interestingly enough, Juan actually sends in Crawdon instead of Kingdra here, which surprised me a bit. I didn't bother to talk about Crawdon at all in the team review, and this is why. Just gonna put this poor creature out of its misery. So going into Kingdra now, we are in fantastic shape, with the entire party maintaining very good health. I keep our Pikachu clone in to see how far he can take this Kingdra on one on one. And clearly, Minin wanted to prove that he's one of our most valuable because this battle was nuts. The paralysis on Kingdra came up huge for us. At one point, we missed two Thunderbolts in a row, but it didn't matter because Kingdra was paralyzed on both of those turns. I also didn't realize just how much damage Thunderbolt would deal. I, I mean, I was expecting maybe around 40% at the most, but it looks more like 50% on our range. Uh, 
I did do an experiment at one point in this battle with Encore just to see if it would lock Kingdra into using Rest after it woke up. But as it turns out, this does not work, so don't try it. That error did not make a difference though, as Kingdra remained asleep for the Thunderbolts that followed. The second Thunderbolt hits the favorable side of the damage range, Kingdra falls, and our gym challenge is complete. We are of course entering the final stretch before the Pokemon League, and what better way to start off by training up some of my team members. I don't have the full team in mind just yet, although I will say I'm pretty confident in 5 of the 6 slots at the moment. We'll have to see what the final results look like after I think about it more during my preparations. After doing some good old fashioned daycare grinding, I pick up the various items lying around the waterfall related areas. The extra rare candies are certainly nice, and Dragon Claw and Iron Tail are… well, I'm not sure yet. As I'm recording this, I don't even know if anyone I have in the box can even use Dragon Claw, so it could end up being useless as it normally is. And just for fun, I take on the few remaining trainers in Meteor Falls. These ones are pretty good actually. It's nice to see a Metacham in Emerald, although it would have been even nicer if you could, you know, actually obtain one in this game, but I digress. With all of that stuff out of the way, let's head on over to Victory Road to take on Wally and pick up our last encounter of the run. Time for team review. This is the team we've brought to trek through Victory Road, and it's honestly quite good. And I didn't even need an HM slave this time. I had a few options as my lead here, but decided to go with Relicanth to take out Wally's Altaria. This should bait out his Rosalia and those grass moves, and that's where Kecleon will make his appearance. Since he'll be hit by that incoming grass move, he himself will become a grass type, which will basically render all of Rosalia's other moves useless except for Toxic. And I've equipped our boy with the Petra Berry to deal with that. Once Rosalia goes down to an Ice Beam or two, I'm not really sure who to expect to come out next. If it's Delcaddy, I'll most likely just keep in Kecleon as long as he's still healthy. Brick Break should make quick work of one of the worst Pokemon in this generation. Same deal with Magneton, honestly. Kecleon could end up putting a ton of work in on this fight. If Kecleon cannot go against Magneton, I do have Pinsir though, as a fantastic backup with Earthquake or Brick Break. I don't really think it matters which one I use, either case should bring Magneton down I would imagine. And then finally, we we have that Gardevoir to deal with, and as I've told you guys in the past, the best way to deal with this thing is basically any Dark type. Future Sight is a thing, but the damage from that tends to be fairly negligible compared to Psychic, and that Psychic won't be able to hit your Dark types, so Sableye is here to dispose of Wally's Ace and Wally himself. Tropius and Corsola will be on the sideline this time, but can fill in if they need to. One last boss fight before the Pokemon League. Let's get to it. I open up with Relicanth and go for the Ancient Power right away. Wally starts setting up a Dragon Dance, but that wouldn't have mattered even if Ancient Power didn't kill here, as Altaria's only physical move was Aerial Ace, which wouldn't have done anything to Relicanth anyway. Rosalia comes out, and so I switch into Kecleon to take the Magical Leaf. I then accidentally misclick Brick Break because that's where Ice Beam used to be and I already forgot that I switched the moves, but Rosalia ends up missing the first Toxic anyway. Another turn later, Rosalia lands the Toxic, I shut it off with a Berry, and proceed to take out the pretty Flower Pokemon. Delcaddy comes in next, and so I stay in with Kecleon. Now I can use Brick Breaks. The first one does not kill, and then Wally goes for a Hyper Potion. Luckily we hit the range on the second attempt, and Delcaddy is done. Magneton comes out, and I'm still super healthy and not all that worried with my huge special booty, so I stay in. Magneton misses the supersonic, and Brick Breaks hit for a lot. After the Hyper Potion, I land another one and bring him down into the red. And we're then hit with a Thunderbolt for some pretty insignificant amount of damage, honestly. Yeah, I guess I am a bit overleveled for Wally than I normally am. I normally wait to level up to the lead cap until after Victory Road, so this is a little awkward. Gardevoir is in now, and I switch into Sableye to dispose of him. Nothing much to say, really. Wally did not stand a chance here. If I can remember in the future, I'll probably just go back to waiting to level up my team to the league cap until after Wally. It's just more interesting that way. 
And after the fight, I honestly just decided to skip out on our last encounter in Mawile because as I was kind of looking into ways I could use him, it became pretty clear that he just wasn't going to make the cut for the league. Mawile would actually be a pretty decent Pokemon if it weren't for those stats and the fairly limited move pool. It's another Pokemon that I definitely need to try out one day, but that day will not be today. I'd also rather just obtain him in a game where I actually get him from Granite Cave instead of Victory Road. Probably more useful in the early game. With Wally down and out, I grind through the rest of Victory Road and finally come out the other side, right before the Pokemon League. And as always, this is the part where I spend a bunch of time thinking about the construction of my team and how to approach the Elite Four and Champion. But luckily for you guys, the team review for the League starts right now. Say hello to the final six that made the cut, and will hopefully take us to the promised land. Other than there being two rock water types in here, the type spread is actually pretty diverse overall, which is great. And I've really enjoyed playing with everyone here so far, and it feels really good to finally identify some of the strengths and weaknesses that these guys have, especially the ones that I haven't gotten to really play with before. For the team review, instead of going through each Pokemon on the team, I'll go through each member of the league instead, and what I'm going to try and accomplish against each one. But before that, let's say one last goodbye to our fallen friend and to those who didn't make the team. I am okay with Ilamize, Seviper, and definitely Love Disc making the box team, but it is sad to finally say goodbye to Castform, Solrock, Pinsir, and Absol. Castform and Solrock came up absolutely huge in so many fights, and I felt like I didn't get to use Pinsir or Absol very much, especially to the best that they could possibly be capable of. Pinsir was definitely the closest out of everyone here to making the cut, but ultimately his typing and lack of special bulk for this Pokemon League are just too glaring of issues to have. Relic Kinth's typing is really what made the biggest difference in deciding who to go with for that last spot. And with all that being said, let's officially get into the team review. Sydney is up first as always, and also as always is probably not going to be much of a threat. It's always hard to judge the first member of any Elite Four from a Nuzlocking perspective because the cap is normally just so much higher than what they can deal with. But to be fair to us Nuzlockers, Sydney's team is also just filled with underperforming Pokemon. For his Mighty Anna, I have Tropius because I felt like it, and Tropius won't be affected at all by Intimidate either. For Shiftry and Cacturn, I have Kecleon and his Ice Beams, again, pretty self-explanatory explanatory, neither Pokemon are really all that threatening. I mean, come on, you gave Shiftry extra sensory and that's it? Minin will shred Crawdon to pieces, just like Wands. And finally, Relicanth should be able to handle Absol without too much of an issue. Absol is of course the scariest, but also the weakest defensively at the same time. If for some reason Relicanth can't get it done, then I always have Corsola as well. Or anyone else for that matter, since I'm expecting everyone to be fairly healthy throughout most of the fight. Next up is Phoebe, and Kecleon is going to take the lead on this one against her first Dusclops. Faint attack should two-shot it, or one-shot it if Dusclops decides to go for Curse. I'll also use Kecleon on her Sableye as well, as that should make great use of Kecleon's color change ability. I'm going to go with our own Sableye on hopefully both Banettes. Shadow Ball has about a 50-50 shot of taking them down in a single attack, which would be super nice if that could happen. If not, I think he's bulky enough to take a Thunderbolt or two with Banette's lackluster special attack. And the final Dusclops could end up being a team effort. If Sableye is healthy enough, I'll try throwing up the Toxic, but if not, then maybe I can paralyze him with Minin and stall with Corsola or Relicanth from there. Phoebe in general is always kind of a free-for-all with these types of challenges, unless you have a dark type of course. Moving on to Glacia, and the plan is very simple overall, but I can never discount that wall rain, and that will certainly be the biggest issue here. Minin will lead the team into this fight by Thunderbolting the first Celio. Relicanth should be very well equipped overall to deal with the Glalies and possibly the other Celio as well, he's just not going to be able to stand toe to toe with Walrein, so using him up as much as possible on Glacia's other threats is the way to go here. Minin can also take out the other Celio if needed though. And for the Walrein, honestly I don't really have a great plan for him. Sableye will probably die if I just try to use him, Tropius is obviously a no-go, and Relicanth will be out of commission by that point of the fight as well. So it's probably going to be a combination of Minin, Kecleon, and Corsola that will have to get this done. Kecleon's color change is decent here, and I will have Ancient Power as well on multiple Pokemon, so we'll see how that goes. But now we have Drake, and this is probably going to be the most 
most difficult fight of the whole league right here. In the majority of my runs, I've always had either a bulky or a speedy Ice Beam user that would basically decimate his entire squad. But in this case, I've got a Corsola and a Kecleon who aren't frail by any means, but are definitely slower than almost anything in the entire game. And not as bulky as like a Walrein, for example. I'm going to end up risking some crits on this one, I think, so pray for me. I'm leading with Kecleon to take out Shelgon and hopefully Salamence as well. The really rough part here is that Shelgon is actually going to be faster, so I'll be taking some damage right off the bat. Corsola will obviously be the backup here if Kecleon can't get the job done against Salamence. Tropius will be taking on Flygon one-on-one. -on -one. It might seem impossible considering that Flygon has Flamethrower, but this Tropius' special defense is utterly nuts. It's just going to be a very PowerPoint intensive fight, but it'll get done. Kingdra and Altaria are just going to have to be handled by whoever is left over at that point. Minin can set up Thunder Wave on Kingdra to help with the Dragon Dances, or I could try setting up Toxic with Sableye, but he might die if I try it. This battle is definitely uncertain and scares the hell out of me. And then finally, we have the champion, Wallace. Minin is leading the charge on this one, taking out Wailord with a few Thunderbolts. The first Thunderbolt should deal enough damage to make Water Spout pretty weak, and if he sets up a Rain Dance instead, that shouldn't be too much of an issue. I'll be expecting either Gyarados or Whiskash to come out next, and if it's Gyarados, I'll just zap it again with another Thunderbolt. In my experience, it typically is Gyarados that comes out against the Electric types, ironically, and hopefully that happens here as well. For Whiskash, I'll switch into Tropius, of course, and that shouldn't be much of a problem. And at that point, I'll be expecting either Tentacruel or Milotic afterwards. For Tentacruel, I'm going to give Corsola a go at that, with any damaging moves outside of Ice Beam. Corsola's typing just works really, really well against Tentacruel's move pool, and I always have Recover to heal myself back up. Tropius will come back in for Ludicolo, as he resists or is immune to all of his moves, and it will just end up being a war of who has more power points to use. And finally, Milotic, who is still kind of up in the air, honestly. Minin and Kecleon can deal a decent amount of damage, but they'll only be around for a single hit, I think. At that point, I may have to sack someone for a clean switch, unfortunately, but I should have enough left over as long as I didn't lose anyone earlier in the final push. Fingers crossed. I'm not wasting any time with this episode. Sydney, I'm sorry I gotta do this to you, bud, but you're not stopping me. Mighty Ann is up first, and I send in Tropius to deal with him. Intimidate doesn't affect Tropius in the slightest, and the combination of Tropius's defenses, paired with that 9 level gap between himself and Sydney's puppy, yeah, this isn't going to be much of an issue. A few magical leaves and Giga Drains, and Mighty Anna goes down. Sydney goes for his ace early, and so I switch into Relicanth to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Disaster Pokémon. The Swords Dance comes out right away, which is always terrifying, but Relicanth's physical defense is quite high, and he resists a lot of Absol's attacks. The Rock Slides were a little concerning, honestly, with several opportunities for a flinch to land that would have probably forced me to switch out. I actually forgot that Rock-type moves actually hit for neutral damage against other Rock-types, and at one point in this fight, a crit could have ended Relicant's League run early. Luckily, we eventually make it through the Landslide, and Sydney's Ace goes down. Next up is Cacturn, and our Kecleon should have a field day with this one. After taking a few hits from Needle Arm and Fan Attack, a single Ice Beam erases the Cactus from existence. Shift Tree follows his fellow Grass type up and will suffer the same fate. The best part is that he can't even hit us with anything because Shift Tree's only attacking move here is Extra Sensory, and Kecleon had just turned into a Dark type thanks to Cacturn's Fan Attack. Sydney sends out his final Pokemon, and, well, I, I think we all know what happens next. Crawdont falls, and Sydney is finished. One down, four to go. Alright, Phoebe, Sydney went exactly as expected. Let's see if you got any surprises for us.
I have Kecreon here to take on her horde of ghost types. Faint attack should put in some serious work. Phoebe's first Dusclops annoyingly goes for protect as much as possible in an attempt to deplete my power points, but luckily it doesn't take too long for Faint attack to finally get the job done. Phoebe sends out the first Bennett, and I decided to switch into Sableye since I'm fairly confident in Shadow Ball killing here. Unfortunately, what I did not account for until it actually happened was the burn from Will-O-Wisp. I don't really care so much about the damage over time effect, as much as the reduction in Sableye's physical attack stat. Well, it looks like I'll only be using Sableye for one Bennett, and not both. In the process of throwing out my Shadow Balls, Bennett spams Grudge in an attempt to completely deplete our Shadow Ball PP. I'm not really all that worried about it though, as the burn is going to be too annoying to deal with moving forward, and Sableye isn't going to be used at all to deal with anything else at this point. Phoebe sends out her next Pokemon, and after Sableye throws out a quick Confuse Ray at an inferior, less attractive version of himself, I switch him out for Kecleon. Kecleon's color change ability here is just pretty good overall, as Sableye is forced to use Faint Attack first and then Shadow Ball, and then it can actually hit us for something more than just not very effective damage. It does not get to that point, as a second Faint Attack from Kecleon is enough to take Sableye out. The second Bennett comes in and can't really do all that much to hurt us, considering her most powerful moves are special based, and Bennett's special attack is pretty poor to say the least. Kecleon's special defense is also quite high, and so Bennett resorts to spamming Facade as that appears to be what will deal the most damage. It does hit for a decent chunk, but obviously nowhere near enough to stop Kecleon's onslaught of faint attacks. Phoebe's ace finally comes in, and while this second Dusclops does have some great coverage options, its offensive stats are so low that it shouldn't give our remaining team members too much of an issue. I predicted the Earthquake on Kecleon and switched into Tropius to negate it. I keep Tropius in for another turn, knowing that he'll be just fine taking at least one Ice Beam or a Rock Slide perhaps. The Ice Beam does come out and deals quite a lot, and so I go for another switch, this time into Minin. There's no reason to rush at this point, so I go for the longer game. After switching in, I have Minin go for the Encore to lock Dusclops into using Ice Beam for the next several turns. From there, I can throw out a Thunder Wave and a few Charms to force Dusclops into critting us to actually get any meaningful physical damage in with Earthquake. What's really nice about Encore is that it will tell you when the effect has ended after the turn is actually over. The effect doesn't have a chance to end in the middle of a turn, or as the turn is starting, like Sleep or Confusion. After Minin takes enough damage, I switch into Relicanth to see if he can bring this one home. And as it turns out, a single critical strike from Ancient Power is enough to bring Phoebe down. Some twists and turns with Phoebe for sure, but nothing too scary yet. Glacia, on the other hand, is a little more concerning. I lead with Minin and swiftly dispose of her first Celia with a vicious Thunderbolt. The first Glalie comes out and thankfully it's not the one that explodes. I switch into Relicanth and take the incoming Icy Wind. I don't believe the speed drop really matters at all here as Relicanth should always be slower anyway. And I start going for Ancient Powers while Glalie switches to Crunch. The damage from Crunch is definitely more significant, but Ancient Power is hitting a lot harder. Glacia goes for the Full Restore, which could open the door for a potential Omni Boost at some point. Fingers crossed. After getting hit with another Crunch, another Ancient Power takes Glalie out. The Exploding One comes in next, and I decided to stay in to go for a rest to heal back up. Glalie goes with Hail, which I'm fine with overall. I don't really think any of its other attacking moves would have brought Relicanth down anyway, even with a crit. After Relicanth is all rested up, he is awoken with the Chesto Berry, and I go on the offense again. The incoming Ice Beam is pretty insignificant, and my Ancient Power is most definitely not. The first Glalie must have had a nature that boosted physical defense. 
it's the only explanation I have for one-shotting the second one with an additional two levels attached to it. Things have been going very smoothly so far, but now we've got this big boy to figure out. There is no way Relicanth is going to survive here, so I have to make a switch, and I decide to go into Kecleon. I'm fully expecting the Surf here, and this is definitely helpful since Kecleon's color change will now morph him into a typing that will resist Walrein's most powerful attacks. The hail damage is really not feeling so great though, and hopefully that doesn't play a factor into how the rest of the fight goes. I went for the Ancient Power first to see if I can get lucky with an Omni Boost, but unfortunately no luck was there. After the Citrus Berry does its thing, I decide to go for one more as I'm fairly confident I can take this next hit. No Omni Boost again, but I wasn't expecting to stay in anyway, even if we did get it here. We were able to pop Walrein Citrus Berry, which is definitely helpful, and that's all the work I can ask Kecleon to perform on this one. Based on my calculations, Minin is the most logical course to take here, as Thunderbolt will definitely kill from this range, and all I have to do is survive a single Surf. I believe there was a crit range in which Minin could have been killed, but it was less than a 50% chance even if the crit did land, so I took my chances here. After the non-crit from Walrein Surf, a quick thunderbolt brings him down. And with Glacius' other Celio bringing up the rear, I just keep mining in to finish the job. That wall rain is always tough to navigate, especially with the possibility of sheer cold coming out and completely messing up any strategies I had in place for the other League members. But we made it through, and it's on to the next challenge. Next up is Drake, and what would transpire in this battle would be unlike anything I have ever experienced. Strap in, cause this one was wild. I led with Kecleon against Shelgon, and this matchup played out pretty much exactly how I expected. This Shelgon is very protect happy, which normally makes this a fairly decent Pokemon to set up against, but we don't have any setups in this league run, and we're slower, so I'll have to wait until I take some damage, or pray that he tries to go for two protects in a row and fails. Shelgon would eventually settle on Double Edge, which admittedly deals a ton of damage to Kecleon. The Ice Beam does eventually come out, and Drake's lead finally falls. Altaria actually comes out next, which did surprised me a little bit, although against the Kecleon I suppose Drake's choice could have just been random here. Normally his Salamence comes out next, but I'm actually pretty happy about this, because Altaria doesn't stand a chance against Kecleon, and he tends to use Dragon Dance first like Winona's does. This is exactly what transpired, and another Ice Beam brings down the Cloud Chicken. Kingdra is out now, and this is usually a little more difficult to navigate, since it's Drake's only Pokemon that isn't weak to ice. I decided to keep Kecleon in to try to get a little bit of chip damage, but Kingdra's smokescreen got me on back-to-back -back attacks. At which point I said screw it, and decided to switch out since I'm expecting Dragon Dances to start coming out at any time now, and this is not a good thing to happen. I decided to go with Sableye and attempt a Toxic setup. This would unfortunately require us to dodge a crit, but I did say we would have to take some risks in this fight. Surf deals just under half, and the second... doesn't crit, and we land the Toxic. I throw out a Protect on the next turn just to get some poison damage in, and then I switch into Tropius to take what is surely going to be another Surf. I decided to keep Tropius in to see how much damage I could deal with Giga Drain, and as it turns out, it's not that much honestly, and Kingdra is starting to set up Dragon Dances, which is not fun. At this point, it looks like Kingdra's health is low enough that Drake will probably want to go for the full restore, which is not a great situation for us, but it does give us the opportunity to clearly switch into something else at least. So I decided to go with Minin, and the idea would be to set up Paralysis here. But in a bizarre turn of events, Drake doesn't go for the full restore and decides to switch out as well, this time for his Salamence. Very interesting move from the AI there. I'm actually pretty good with this situation though, as I know Minin is faster, and getting up a Thunder Wave would be huge. Key words there, would be. The Thunder Wave does land, and I even get in a charm as well for good measure, although I did have to risk a crit for that, so I'm not entirely sure it was worth it. 
But now, <laughs> oh, oh boy. Now we get into the main event. This battle between Corsola and Salamence is a statistical oddity. The plan here is very simple. Use Recover each turn to gain all the health back from the damage dealt by Dragon Claw until Salamence is paralyzed and can't move, at which point I can start hurling Ice Beams or Ancient Powers until he falls. This plan is still risky because a crit at any point could potentially kill me on a range. If I'm keeping a correct count, this Salamence avoided paralysis for at least 8 turns in a row if I include the back and forth with mining. I don't know what was more unlikely to happen here. Salamence avoiding paralysis eight times in a row or avoiding a dragon claw crit after its PP was nearly completely erased. But ironically, you know what has better odds? Hitting the Omni Boost on my first Ancient Power that I could actually use. And then Salamence is paralyzed for the second turn in a row. This exchange is ridiculous. If anyone out there is interested in running the math on that sequence, let me know what you find, because I would be very interested in learning to know what those odds are. And because I got the Omni Boost from Ancient Power, I did use it again on the next turn, since it will most certainly kill now, and I might as well go for an extra shot at another Omni Boost. I mean, come on, after what transpired here, it's not exactly out of the question that I would get another one at this point. Salamence goes down, and now Flygon comes out to play. Even with the Omni Boost, though, Earthquake is still too much of a risk here, and I was planning on using Tropius anyway. The only way that Flygon can take down Tropius statistically is if he crits twice in a row and I'm cool with those odds, honestly. Flygon would eventually land that first crit with Flamethrower, bringing Tropius down pretty low. But luckily the follow-up does not crit and we're able to use a few healing moves to top ourselves off again. Without any more crits for the remainder of the fight, it would be only a matter of time before Tropius would have his way with Flygon. Drake sends out his Kingdra again, and this time decides to heal it up with a full restore. This got very scary actually, as the majority of my team was pretty beat up at this point, and I didn't have much else to lean on, especially if Kingdra starts to go for dragon dances again. And spoiler alert, it would start dancing several times on us eventually. Not a fun situation to be in, but we do have ways out of this. After the scary crit on Tropius, Giga Drain brings Kingdra down into the red, and Drake should be out of healing items at this point. I'm expecting another body slam here, so I switch into Sableye to negate the attack. And at this point, I know Kingdra is definitely going to go for Surf, but I don't have a lot of options. I eventually decided on Corsola, since two Surfs would be a range to kill. I have to risk one last crit. Please. Corsola lives, and the Psychic brings Kingdra down. That is one of the most unique and also stressful Drake fights I've ever experienced. I'm super proud of the team for pouring that one out, and no one had to be sacrificed. I've already had enough excitement for one episode, but we can't stop now. Just one more obstacle standing in our way. This series ends now. One of the smallest against one of the biggest, but these Thunderbolts don't discriminate, and Minin's first draws blood immediately. I'm actually a little surprised that killed there, as I was expecting not to hit the very unlikely range, but it's possible that Wailord could have had a nature that reduced its special defense. Pokemon number two is Gyarados, and that couldn't have worked out more perfectly for us, as this is going to be as free as it gets. 
Another brutal bolt of lightning sends Gyarados to a watery grave. The Whiskash comes out next as expected, and so I switch into Tropius to negate the Earthquake. It doesn't matter much what this thing tries to do, as Tropius is expertly equipped to deal with whatever Whiskash throws at him. After some back and forth, Wallace does decide to throw out the Hyper Beam as a last resort before Whiskash goes down. Smart play, as that definitely has the most impact on this matchup, and will make things a little bit more awkward for us than it would have been. I'm not gonna lie, I was expecting slash hoping for the Tentacruel here, but we get Wallace's Ace and Milotic instead. Similar to Glacius, Walrein, and Drake's Kingdra, there are just not a whole lot of ways to deal with this thing cleanly. I'm fully expecting Ice Beam here, so I ultimately decided to switch into Relicanth here for some resistance. There really wasn't a great switch here in general, and Relicanth wouldn't be needed for the rest of the fight, so I wanted to see if I can pull off a Yawn before having to switch out, or potentially sacrifice him. But, unfortunately, he won't get the chance. The crit brings Relicant down, giving us our first loss of the whole league. It was a pleasure using you in battle, buddy. At least you got to live 100 million years. This does allow us to cleanly switch into Minin to pick up where we left off at the beginning of this fight, which is raining thunderbolts on Wallace's head. The first one deals a ton, and Milotic sets up the Toxic. The Citrus Berry also procs, so I'm not expecting a kill anymore, and another Thunderbolt just barely brings him down into the red, and then Milotic follows that up with a Recover. This is definitely the preferred option though, as now the next Thunderbolt should kill now. And it does. Next up is Tentacruel, and I decide to switch Minin out to reduce the poison damage coming from Toxic. This will allow me to potentially take a hit later on if I happen to be slower, which it's very close. It could even be a speed tie, honestly, with Tentacruel. I send Sableye out to try and bait Tentacruel into using some Hydro Pumps. If I can get him to waste a few on Sableye, that would make the matchup a lot easier for our Corsola to navigate around. We are able to get Tentacruel to use a few, but the last one would unfortunately crit, and Sableye is the next to fall. You were fantastic as always, buddy. A key member of our run, and I thank you for your services. Corsola is now up next, and all I have to do is avoid a crit from the remaining Hydro Pumps, and I should be in great shape. We avoided the first one, and then the last one. That's definitely big for us, but now we're put on a timer with Toxic, so it's time to start throwing out Psychics. The first one isn't enough to kill, and Wallace goes for the full restore. With Toxic starting to ramp up, I decide to switch into Kecleon to alleviate some of that poison damage for now. Kecleon takes the incoming Ice Beam, and then takes the following Toxic. And, on the ensuing Ancient Power, we get the Omni Boost. Will the next one bring this bastard down? Just... Barely not enough, and unfortunately that means another full restore. Damn. There's no sense in switching out at this point, it's just too risky. So Kecleon is going to have to lay it all out there. Give us a crit, buddy, come on. But it just wasn't meant to be, and half of our team is now gone. I'm gonna miss him the most. This was the first Kecleon I have ever heavily played with, and I was very impressed and pleasantly surprised with what he's able to do for the team. One of the best members of this run, for sure. Thankfully, Minin does outspeed, and another Thunderbolt finally brings Tentacruel down. And last up is this dreadful Ludicolo. But thankfully, we've got a very good solution in Tropius. After throwing out a quick Thunder Wave, I make the switch. 
Tropius resists both of Ludicolo's attacking moves and is immune to Leech Seed, making him a fantastic counter. The icing on the cake would have been Aerial Ace, but I'll accept Fly as the alternative. There are obviously a few double teams that come out, so this was a bit of a process to get through, but in the end, not a whole lot of power points were needed, and Wallace's final Pokemon eventually goes down. And with that, this series and season are now over. Another fantastic playthrough in the books, and it only took a single attempt. I loved all of the new Pokemon I got to play around with, but especially the Rainy Rao Pokemon in Castform, Tropius, and Kecleon. All three played hugely important roles throughout most of the game, and I've gotta say, my opinion on each has shifted quite a bit as a result. I really hope you guys enjoyed the series and the first season of Grumpy Gengar. In the meantime, as usual, please like the video if you liked it, and subscribe for more content like this. That's it for me, I'll see you guys in Sinnoh.